Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 482. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger, and today's February 1st, 2019. Okay, people, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted. Uh, look... Audience participation time. I'm going to get to my show notes because you think by now I could remember all this. Um, we're having a growing audience. We really thank you. More and more subscribers. We thank you for that too. The comments are just going crazy on YouTube. You know, 40, 50, 100 comments per episode. We appreciate that very much. So, as audience participation members who really, really, really like us, you know, Sally Fields like us type like us. Like the program. Click on YouTube that you like it. Click on Facebook where you see the program that you like it. Please share with your friends. Share with your enemies. Share with your clergy. Share with your laity. Share, share, share. Comment. We love the comments. We read all the comments. You guys keep the um, the discussion going, and we appreciate that. So don't forget to do that. Also, if you have not subscribed yet, go to YouTube and subscribe. And if you are... And I call you highbrow people because you guys have little devices you listen to us on. If you want to do the podcast, in the show notes of our YouTube are the, the, the ways to click and subscribe to the podcast. George, how you doing down there in Florida? Just great, Kevin. It's probably about 60 degrees warmer down here than it is up there. Yeah, we're uh, yesterday, 2 degrees. Today, 18. Not bad at all. <coughs> So, 18 yeah. mile, you you get out the suntan lounge <laughs> and the barca lounge and be outside this yeah, afternoon. So I have to turn off my Dick Tracy watch here because somebody, like a customer, is going to call during the show like they always do. Um, oh, I hate to, Kevin, I hate to tell you, it's in the low 60s here. It's not 60 degrees warmer. So I, I, I misspoke. It's only about 50 degrees warmer. Well, so. we have a friend from uh, Miami that watches the program, and she said it was 58 down there, and she was miserable. So, you know. But no, when it is cold in Florida, it is colder for the same temperature rating than it is up north because we have no insulation. We're not used to it. And uh, I have my sweater and my woolly jacket, and it's in the low 60s. Well, we rented a house once for a week around Christmas, and I well, it must have been Miami, and there wasn't a heater. They had air conditioning only. Is that very common down there? Yes, especially in, my, in the Miami area because, well... Yes. Yes, because <laughs> we, don't we were have, expecting we don't have, global warming. <laughs> no, we don't have fireplaces. We don't have chimneys. Uh, yeah. But everything has uh, central air conditioning built in the last 30 years. Yeah. So right now our audience is like, you know, we didn't really sign on to watch a show about the weather. Well, we get that. Okay. So because we're talking about a hard topic. We're going to talk about abortion this week. And abortion is a big topic, especially in the Christian realm, in the Episcopal Church realm, the Anglican Communion realm, and the Church of England realm. Um, believe it or not, you can support abortion by not saying a word. Um, it's one of those things, uh, like within the Church of England, they don't endorse abortion. There's no official uh, uh, platform anywhere within their constitution and canons where they uh, support it. But unofficially, they seem to endorse it, George. Well, that's an argument. It's that, an argument. That... Well, okay, let's back up. Ten years ago, we had Rowan Williams. He did not endorse abortion. He was a proponent of abortion. Um, I don't know how pro-life he was. Oh, but no, he, he was an opponent of abortion. Right. And so uh, when it came to abortion on the man, he, he spoke against it. Rowan Williams spoke out eloquently and repeatedly about uh, the moral consequences of uh, abortion. He supported the Society for the Protection of Unborn Children. He was very active, very loudspoken, and he offered cogent theological, moral, and ethical issues why abortion uh, on demand was not Christian. Um, so could you say that the Church of England under Rowan Williams was anti-abortion, and now that Justin Welby doesn't hasn't said word one, it's pro-abortion, or, or can you say that the leadership uh, colors the perception of the stance of the church? Well, let's move on to the Episcopal Church. In the Episcopal Church, under Browning and uh, certainly before uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, uh, it would seem that they were against abortion. They certainly did not support it. 
Um, the Episcopal the, Church is a difficult case because it, it's one that you can argue on technicalities, but the public face of the Episcopal Church the past 20, 30 years has been pro-abortion, even though the formal stance of the Church has been either neutral or negative. Now, people say, well, what? I thought the Episcopal Church backed abortion because you read the name Episcopal Church in these religious coalition for reproductive choice leaflets and everything. Well, that is not true. A number of years ago, the Executive Council, on its own action, endorsed the, re the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice, which is a pro-abortion group. The General Convention has never done so, nor has the Constitution or canons or any statement from the National Church done what the Executive Council has done. Some dioceses, like Central Florida, for instance, specifically by diocesan resolution, repudiated the stance taken by the Executive Council. But, you know, at the end of the day, those are just words. Um, so, like, from where I stand, the Episcopal Church stands in the pro-life camp. But if you stand in a different corner of the Episcopal Church, it stands in the pro-abortion camp. Well, it wasn't but six or seven years ago we had a clergy person up here in the Northeast tell us abortion was a blessing. Dean of a seminary. Dean uh, of a seminary. <laughs> Episcopal Divinity School, the late Episcopal Divinity School in Cambridge. Yeah. She gave a speech in Alabama saying abortion is, a, I think it was a sacrament or a blessing. A blessing. It's yeah. a gift. Mm -hmm. And see, here's the problem that people like to wrap themselves around the mantle of this is the Episcopal position. And frankly, the Episcopal Church has no ability to take positions. I can remember in the, uh, I think it was the, 80s or the early 90s, Ed Browning came out saying the Episcopal Church supports the bombing of Belgrade by Bill Clinton. I remember that. Yeah. And I'm thinking, you know, let's see, Sinai, you know, Ten Commandments, number 11, must have been left off that second printing, thou shalt bomb Belgrade. Uh, you know, leaders say and do things that they believe, but their actions in no way uh, commit the wider church unless it's in the constitution or in the book of common prayer it's not necessary it's not well yeah presiding bishop michael curry has spoken in favor of abortion he's spoken in favor of climate change he's spoken in favor of all these you know more liberal things but it's still not the official policy of the episcopal church correct right, correct okay. those are michael curry's views mm -hmm. uh alan Alan Haley, our friend and partner on this uh, show, has spoken many times about what actually a resolution of convention means. It's a snapshot of opinion on a certain day. Unless a resolution is changed into a canon or a constitutional amendment or into the reform of the Book of Common Prayer, it is not an ongoing forever statement. I'm sure we have resolutions from the General Convention of the 1850s on the Civil War, uh, you know, what uh, on slavery and things like that. May or may not, I don't know. I'm sure but you my, <laughs> But my, the point that I'm trying to make is that this the, the topic of abortion, we need to separate its different layers. There's the moral and ethical issues which I think Kevin and I are in complete agreement on. We are in complete and agreement. And then there's, then there's the political uh, thing, where we have New York uh, adopting a law to allow abortion up to the moment of birth, Virginia and Vermont contemplating such laws, and we have people using the Episcopal Church's name to advance a political agenda. And I personally find that offensive. They have no right to do that. Well, I, I mention this because the tide, from what I see, is changing. Uh, this latest generation, the millennial generation, is not a pro-abortion as the previous generation. So I don't know how this went off track because uh, on every other cause, there is liberal and uh, Slavic Soviet as you can get. But for this one, they, they see life and they want to give life a chance. And, you know, I talked to, you know, these millennials who are liberal on every other topic and like, yeah, I'm not pro-abortion. Sorry. What? Well, <laughs> abortion has been an aspect, uh, has been a part of the life of my ministry ever since I started. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, my first position was as a hospital chaplain and in training, I did a rounds in a psychiatric ward and 
I met a young woman and we began to talk and she was despondent and she confided in me that she had had an abortion and the guilt of having that abortion was so profound that it sent her into, it resulted in her being hospitalized. Now, the way life has gone for me is that I've not really had ministry among young people who are contemplating abortion or adults where this is a live issue, do I do it or do I not? But ever since I've been in the ministry, time and time and time and time and time again, I've had to counsel women who have had abortions, who live with the grief and the self-hatred and the horror and the destruction of what they've done, and trying to help them know that there is a way out, that God loves them no matter what they've done. So for me, I'm not you know, where I have come down, where I am personally in the abortion controversies, I'm not marching in Washington. It's too cold and too far away. <laughs> too cold. <laughs> I'm with that woman in her 60s who's confided to me that she had an abortion and that it is, and that it's been on her heart for 40 years. Yeah. Uh, this has been a, a key to my ministry since I was 16. Uh, I remember, and my parents are a little more liberal than myself. They're Minnesota Democrats, and mom is uh, part of these communities that send out letters, and uh, somehow they got my name one day. And I got this letter from a pro-abortion group, and I, I'm reading this letter, not knowing it was from a pro-abortion group at the time, and just the emotion in this letter and how women are going to lose their rights. And I, I, it didn't mention abortion until the final paragraph. And I, I'm, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, this is such an emotional letter. And I finally get to the bottom, you know, protect abortion now. Wait a minute. Oh, I, I figured out what, what the magic is here is, you know, to, to bring emotion to this issue in written ways, political ways, that it's a rights issue, it's a women's issue. Um, and I see now how churches get involved without trying, without even knowing they're involved. The Episcopal Church, for better or worse, doesn't know that they're involved in the abortion industry because, oh, we've never taken a political position. Well, your name is being uh, touted as a supporter of abortion. Church of England is being touted, uh, not, not officially, but as a supporter of abortion. And I'm talking about this now because I want to know how these churches are going to react when the laws start changing. What happens when uh, Iowa uh, and Alabama and other states start making abortion completely illegal, what will be the Episcopal Church's response then? What will be um, Church's response to that? Are they going to uh, call, you know, what will be the response, George? Well, I should clarify by this by saying the churches do not respond to these things. Mm -hmm. Individuals respond. It is not the institution's res responsibility to speak as an institution. It's the responsibility of an individual to speak. I, I'll give you a, an example, um, what I mean by this, on a different issue. I was asked um, by a member of our congregation to come join them at the courthouse to rally against the death penalty. I happened to be in favor of the death penalty. But I said, okay, I will come and I will support you because you have made a good faith. You fought this through. You believe this is a moral choice. And I will come and support you, but I'm not going to wear my collar. I'm there to support you because to help you in your moral journey, but to use the authority of the priesthood by my marching around in a collar on a political issue, I find offensive, whether it's whatever the issue is. The job of the church, of the clergy, is not to... T see, this, I, see, I really have problems with the way the Catholic Church operates by saying, this is how you should vote, this is how you should act according to this or that. It is my opinion that the church's responsibility is to educate and teach the scripture and uh, the faith and allow its members to be the ones to act. When the church starts to take a stance, then we're going straight down into the toilet. I'm so, I, I know some people say, well, how could you possibly say it's wrong for a bishop to march in a cassock in a pro-life march, it's still wrong. Because that bishop should be marching in a coat and tie. He should do and say and believe all the things that he believes, but when he uses his office to advance an agenda and an issue that is outside 
of the parameters of his work, I think he's abusing his office. Yeah, I, I disagree. I, I think if a bishop wants to show up in his cassock, because it, in my spiritual life and what I see, uh, I see a bishop offer the Eucharist, the body of Christ, uh, you know, with his cassock on. And if he wants to fight uh, ultra feminism, which is offering, you know, kind of the opposite of the Eucharist here, uh, and I believe. I, see. I, I just can't go there. I just mm -hmm. can't go there because then you are acting as if this is a personal gift or this is a personal action of the priest <coughs> or, or the bishop. The sacraments have nothing to do with the individual celebrate them. That's why we say the worthiness of the priest just has no effect on the efficacy of the sacraments. When you start saying that I am going to dress in a sacramental fashion, it's one thing. If this were a hundred years ago and priests run around in cassocks as All normal day-to-day sure. -day clothing, <laughs> that's different. But if I'm going to dress as if I'm about to perform a sacrament and then take part in a political action, I am abusing the sacrament for a political agenda. And I don't care what that political agenda is. You are demeaning the office by separating the sacramental act from its uh, intention, which is service and worship and praise and glory to God, and putting it into, no matter how prominent the action. Now, uh, I, I believe strongly on this point, and I know this is an unpopular belief, but I do believe part of the problem of mainline Christianity in the United States is that it's become too closely intertwined with politics. So you could start it in the Civil War, in the Civil Rights Movement, you could say it was in Vietnam, you could say it's in, in Ed Browning going to the White House in a cassock supporting the bombing of Sarajevo. Uh, sorting the bombing of Belgrade. Belgrade Whatever yeah. it is, when you when you do that, man, you're abusing your office that God has given you. Well, but good. you don't agree. Well, we disagree. <laughs> well, it, but I'm not a bishop or a clergy person. Uh, I don't have the uh, full envisionment of exactly the sacramental life, which is fine. But I do disagree because I think um, life is that important. But for technicalities you're allowed to disagree with me and no, part but, of the the but, better, but the better part life of the is important yeah. but life is important but where mm -hmm. is the priest's proper job mm -hmm. the proper job is that the priest by himself unless he has the authority of the legislature or government or the ability for moral suasion the priest's job is to be there for the person before the abortion or be there for the person after the abortion um to offer guidance, counsel, support, love, to help them through. Evil exists, and we are here to help them deal with that evil on a personal level. When we move out of the personal into the political, I think we're going down a road that we just, we just are mistaken. I mean, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God. Now, that doesn't mean that all ethical issues taken up by politics, the church should stay out of, but rather the church should inform its members and allow its members, the, the lay people, that is the role of the lay people, to live that life into the, into the world. Not for the priests to march around and tell you what to think or do. So, back to what we're seeing. Uh, inevitably, some court case is going to come to the Supreme Court and they're going to overtrain, overtrain, overturn parts, if not all, of Roe v. Wade and send it back to the states. Obviously, New York will always, you know, sadly have abortion, uh, Vermont, uh, Virginia, other places. But it's going to be interesting to watch the churches react um, to what's going to happen locally. Uh, all politics is local. And um, I see certainly liberal elements within the Episcopal Church, the Church of England, that are going to be upset by what they see the Supreme Court in America doing, George. Well, let's move it out of the moral and theological into the political. If Roe versus Wade is overturned, it doesn't do anything. It returns it to the states. Mm -hmm. What that means is New York and California and Vermont will have, their, will have a laws permitting abortion up to the moment of birth. Florida, Iowa, a number of other states have adopted or are in the process of adopting fetal heartbeat laws, meaning once a heartbeat is uh, detectable, no abortion can be performed. Um, some states will outlaw abortion completely. That, and so the 
Roe Roe versus Wade just federalized a state issue, and then it'll go back to the states, and each state will choose its own path. Yeah, it it'll change the debate, um, but this uh, abortion debate will just be part of our society forever. Um, because we don't have just abortion, we have pills we take, we have, you know, certainly other methods of uh, causing uh, abortion. It, it's a sad reality. Yeah, but at the same time, the role of the, the Christian clergy is to educate it, the people so that the perception, so that the knowledge over the course of time will be to see what we've seen actually on the ground which is abortions not happening. Fewer and fewer and fewer are being performed. You know, we're 20 minutes into the show, and I didn't even mention Anglicans for Life. Uh, for the last four years, I've gone down to uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, on warmer times. I've participated in the march, but I've always videotaped the speeches uh, given by the Anglicans for Life and uh, this, uh, found, this ministry founded by Georgette Forney. And uh, it's, it's nice to see uh activism within this that yeah it's certainly political but it's encouraging george yes uh i mean that i endorse the work for anglicans for life which was formerly noel national organization mm -hmm. of episcopalians for life that's where the work should be on that level on that degree of uh, organizations who have a specific you know agenda and brief to do that that's wonderful what mm -hmm. they do, and I think that's fantastic. So we talked about the weather at the beginning of the episode because abortion is a hard topic. We should never have to you know, discuss something like this, but it's a reality of the condition of the 20th century and the 21st century that uh, we as individuals and as a polity make very bad decisions um, to benefit what we would say makes our life easier. We don't want sex to have consequence, um, and it does. George, I want to thank you for hanging out and talking about abortion. That's a tough topic. What you doing this weekend? You're working, aren't you? <coughs> uh, Michael Curry is coming to Orlando tonight. He's going to speak. Uh, the we've He's sold out. Well, we're not charging, but he sold out the First Baptist Church in Orlando. 4,500 seats have all been allotted. And then he's giving a revival tonight. And then tomorrow we have a diocese convention. Cool. Well, and then, then one, two, three, four services on Sunday sure, and Saturday. Well, <laughs> well, if you see Michael, do say hi for me. And uh, we shall have more fun. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode 482 of Anglican Unscripted. I forgot to push these buttons. <coughs> the record button? No, the, uh, the identification button, the date button, and back to the show button. Oh, well. Wow.